My name is uh, John Purcell. I'm a, a reverend in the International and Gospel Assemblies. I'm also an elder in the light of the world missions. We work out from Blackpool, praise God. And we're a gypsy family. And I praise God for the Lord that we have blessed us and blessed us mighty since we've been saved. Well, I'm going on almost seven years saved. I'm six years and ten months saved, praise God. And I never felt as happy in my life. I was 40 odd year binded up in religion and nightlife was my life one time. I was on a party going to hell and I never knew any better. And I thank God for the hand of mercy that took me out of that darkness and brought me into the light and changed my life completely. I praise God for it. I just want to get started here. My, as I said, we're a gypsy family. I have uh, six children. Thomas is a triplet. We lost a boy at birth and we have a, a girl. Uh, his sister is coming home to march in England, praise God. And we have uh, two boys and four girls. And with household salvation, praise God. My eldest son is a lead singer in the band and he was saved first, praise God. And then my daughter Eileen, one of the twins, with twins and triplets. And one of the twins, praise God, went over and she was saved next. And then the other twin. And then Thomas and Melissa were saved. And then I was saved, praise God. And then it took a year after for my wife was saved because she sees something different in us and something that she, that she wanted as well. She wanted to taste it as well. So praise God, the Lord has blessed her mighty as well since she's been saved, praise God. I live in Newry on the main Dublin road. I have a fair big place there. I keep a lot of different type of animals. I have llamas, I have el tacos, I have Scotch Highland cattle, I have... Uh, five donkeys and I brought them home. My wife said I was the biggest jackass of the lot. <laughs> and praise God, we have a big massive camel with two humps also. And we have some miniature uh, we Shetland ponies. And uh, I bought them all for the children. In other words, I was using, I want them for myself, but I used them as an excuse. <laughs> but thank God the Lord is using each one of them because he's bringing people in and I've led a lot of people to the Lord that have come looking at the animals, praise God. Because a man asked me, why, uh, Kevin, have you so much stuff around your home? Well, say so we're fishers and men, and we need all the bait we can get to draw them in. Yeah. So praise God, I've led hundreds of people to me in my own property to the Lord. I have seen miracles. I've seen people healed with cancer. I've seen people healed with nearly every type of business and dessert through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only he, he's the only one that can do it. He's the only one. But if we're open and a vessel for him, well, then he can fill us and use us. And praise God that he is using this. People say to me, how can you go so many different places? You're going to over to England, you're going to America, and you're going up and down the country. How can you run a business like this here? Going away for weeks and then just drop everything. But you see, we never ever should put God second. God must come first at all times. I put God before my own wife and children. Because God is love. And when we, when we love him, then we can love every person on this earth. Not just one group of people. But I thank God that the Lord has given me love for every person on this earth. No matter what nationality, no matter what race they are, no matter what religion they have, God has given me love for them people. He has given me love for lost souls. The way the Lord has shown me, never look at a, a man or a woman no more, how much property they have, how, much, uh, uh, how important that they think they are, how much money they have. Never look at that. Look at their souls as in serious danger of going to hell. And we need to tell them. Because we're living in the end days. And it's up to each one of us to tell those that's not saved. Those is saved, we need to tell the lost. We need to tell them. That's why the Lord have chosen each one of us for to be soldiers in his army. And the battle is certainly not going to be won in the trenches. We need to get out into the fields and start telling people about Jesus Christ. Because we're living in the end days living in the end days but how it all began i want to share i'm sorry it gets carried away i can't help it <laughs> but how it all began nightlife was my life one time 
I, as I said there a while ago, I was on a party going to hell. The very minute it come dark, I come alive like a vampire. Nightclubs, discos, house parties, you name it, I've been there. I have tried drugs, I have tried drink, I tried nearly everything on this earth to try and find a fulfillment. But I spent hundreds of thousands of pounds in nightlife in it. I would think nothing of getting on a plane and flying to London to a party. That's the way it was before I was saved. Nightlife in it. I used to tell fortunes in pubs just for to get a crowd of women around me. That's the way it was. And I thank God for the way the Lord had changed me. A younger brother of mine, he went over to England and he put into this gypsy camp. And nearly every person in the camp was born again Christians. And near London he pulled into this camp. And they got the Bible out and they started opening the Bible and they started reading John chapter 3 that no one will see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. <coughs> I said, oh excuse me, he said, we have our own religion. We are Catholics. So the, the pastor said, he said, excuse me, he said, I'm not talking about religion here. I'm talking about Jesus who died on the cross for every person on this earth. So anyway, my brother said, I never heard about this religion before. He thought it was a brand new religion. And he said, you get a Bible, he said, and you look at John chapter 3, and you'll see what Jesus Christ tells you to do. So that evening, my brother went to a bookshop, and he went and he asked the girl, could he have a Bible? And the girl just pointed where the Bibles was, and he picked up every Bible he opened up. There it was, John chapter 3. Jesus teaches Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless the born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You can hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it has come from or where it is going. So it is like with everyone born of the Spirit. So in other words, you know that you know that you know that you're born again. So praise God. He still wasn't satisfied. He thought it was a new religion, a new Bible. We never ever had a Bible in our life, in our home. Never had a Bible before I was saved. And then he thought it was a new religion. And it won't be on an old Bible. And the next day he went to a car boot sale and he went to this woman and she was a sister in the Lord, and he started telling her about those men, telling them about Jesus, about he must be born again, and she just put her hands up in the air and started thanking Jesus Christ for the Lord bringing a lost soul to her. But she did not sell Bibles or books, but she left her own car and took my brother right across the field where there was a, a sister or brother selling Bibles and books and other things, and thank God, we even taught by the color of the book to be different scriptures. He picked up a red one and a blue one and a black one and a green one and he kept going for the worn and the torn ones. He thought it wouldn't be on the old ones. And I think it's either five or six, the way it won't be telling you a lie, that he bought and he took them home and he opened every one of them up and there it was. No one will see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. No one means everyone. You must be born again. So then he, then he thought it won't be on a Catholic Bible. And he decided to go to a priest and ask the priest, is it on our Bible, in other words? And he went to a priest and he asked the priest, is John chapter 3 on a Catholic Bible? And the priest brought it, he had more or less had a hard with him, and he brought it out and he opened it up and there it was. John chapter 3, that no one will see the kingdom of God unless they're born from above. Right there, there's only one Bible. One true word of God. One true word of God. So praise God. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. There's 18 in our family, 13 boys and 5 girls. And he couldn't wait to get to a phone because the scales was taken from his eyes. And he, he could see out now for the first time in his life. And he knew the danger that the rest of his family's souls was in. And he couldn't wait to get to a phone. I was all cleaned up, all designer clothes on me, going out to nightlife on it. I'm just going out the door and the phone rung. And he said, Kevin, he said, I'm a born-again Christian. 
Say what? I thought it was the most stupidest word I've ever heard in my life when I heard it first. I started thinking about a woman that I knew that was dead and left a big family of children behind them, behind her. How can all the children be born again? Then I knew another woman was about eight stone weight and she had sons and daughters, 20 odd stones. I dare want to have a serious problem. I knew another woman about four foot odd and she had a son over six foot. So he's going to have a problem as well. As my brother was telling me down the phone, I started thinking this way. And I was thinking about flesh. But Jesus is talking about the spirit that lives in your body. Each one of our bodies have life in it. Someday the God, God is going to take the life from each one of our bodies. And our bodies is a heap of meat. Goes into the coffin. Goes into the ground. And goes back into dust. An undertaker will tell you that he certainly cannot put you in a coffin alive. If he found out about it, he'd be done for murder. No one can bury you alive. The life is taken from the body. The body goes in the ground. But where do your life go? Where do your life go? Your life is your soul, your spirit, which goes to God to be judged. And that's what Jesus Christ said must be born again. And I was talking about a heap of meat. But now I know that my body is like a car body. Your car is just empty out there. There's no life in it. When you get into your car, there's life in it. Now you're out of the car. Is a car body out there. Someday you'll be taken from your own body and the soul goes to God to be judged and God is going to say to you, what did you do for my son Jesus? And what are you going to say? But I thank God he said to me on the phone, Kevin, he said, I'm a born again Christian. He said, get a Bible. I said, yes, I get a Bible. I had no intention whatsoever to bring the Bible into our home. I was led by a man, led by a religion, binded up in it. And I didn't know. And now I know that no one's religion, no matter what religion you have, no one's religion can get you to heaven. No one's religion. It's only Jesus Christ can get you to heaven. What good is this building without us in it? What good is a religion without God? If you haven't got God in your religion, then you're in serious danger. If you haven't got the word of God in your religion and preached from the word of God, then you're in danger. A lost man cannot tell you the way. But I thank God anyway. Yes, I get a Bible. Say, what is it like? Say, is it like a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or what? No, he said. This is the truth. He said, I'm telling you to get a Bible and read. And you will see what Jesus Christ says to do. Before you will even see the kingdom of God. So praise God. Yes, say, look, say, let's put it this way. Say, is it keeping you out of trouble? Because he was a wild young man like what I was myself. Yes, he said. Well, then say, it's okay. And I handed the phone over to me, Dr. Riley, and said, hey, you speak to him. I was in a hurry to get to the pub. And away we went to the pub that night, and we had a right laugh about our brother Q in the pub that night. I'm not even tell you what we were calling him. But anyway, every night after, for weeks he was on the phone, every night. And the phone got like a rot boiler. That it was going to nearly eat me. Nobody wanted to go near it no more. You get it, you get it, you get it. Tell him I'm not here, I'm out, I'm gone. Nobody wanted to speak to him no more. Because he knew it was going to be him on the phone. So praise God for him, for the way the Lord used him, praise God. So thank God anyway, a few weeks went, about a week went by, and Thomas and Melissa was going to primary school at the time. And Thomas walked an hour to school, and the headmaster was tidying up his office, and he called Thomas, he said, Thomas, he said, I found a Bible today in my office. And he said, I want you to take it home and give it to your father. I think it's long to one of your uncles that left it there years ago in the school. Take it home to your father and give it to your father. You see, God knows what we're thinking about tomorrow, never mind now. God knew that I had no intention to bring the word of God into our home. He knew that. But when I come home from work, Thomas said, Daddy, he said, the headmaster gave me a Bible and I nearly jumped down his neck. I thought he went asking for a Bible. He said, no, Daddy, I didn't. He said, look, he said, here's me Uncle Q's name I read on the Bible. You see, God brought the Bible into our home. God had chosen me. I did not chose God. If a man had to say to me, seven years from now, you'll be going around preaching. You'll be in a hurry getting the meetings. You'll be all excited to get to meetings. You'll be going berserk. If you, if you want to see souls saved, I would have laughed in the face. I would be going to a pub. It's pub time now, look. I'd be in a pub, drinking and filling all the muck of the day in the pub. That's where I'd be now. But I thank God, God had different plans for me. He had different plans for me. I was a, a, fa a husband to the pub. I was a father to the drink and I didn't know that. I loved the pub, I loved the drink, but I didn't know it. But I thank God for the Lord the way he's changed my life. But praise God, 
Anyway, we looked at the Bible, got my wife, I cannot read or write. And the Lord, thank God, we looked at the Bible, my wife read the scriptures to me. And I was all excited then when I heard the scriptures read to me, praise God. And now I have something to tell my brother when he rings. Do you know when you put a kettle on for a cup of tea and you're in a hurry? It seems to never boil. But it was on the phone every night before we got the Bible. And the very we got the Bible, the phone stopped. It must took about a week or a week and a half before the phone rung back again. And when he did ring back, I was all excited. Q side, we got the Bible and we read the scripture side. It seems all right. And so we see that scripture you were telling us about that we must be born again. And so you'll never believe it, say, it's your Bible. He said, what do you mean my Bible? This is the brother doing all the searching. He said, what do you mean my Bible? Say, so you remember years ago, the time you used to be going to primary school. Say, so the headmaster said that you must have left the Bible. And say, what would I be doing with a Bible in the school? He said, we'd, we'd never have a Bible in the school. What would I be doing with a Bible in the school? Well, say, so your name is written on it. He said, what? Say, so your name is written on the Bible. Well, he said, it must be mine then, but I don't ever remember having the Bible. As I told you, God brought the Bible in. God have chosen each one of us that comes through that door. Each one of us. He knows each one of our hearts. He knows our needs. He knows all about us. He knows our prayers. He knows every movement. Some of you might have got it hard to come here tonight, but you're here. Because God wants you here. And I praise God for it. But praise God anyway, a few weeks went by, and my brother Q rung back. He said, Kevin, he said, we're coming back to Ireland. He said, there's some gypsy families coming back with us, and there's some pastors as well. And we're going to come into Cork, he said, with the caravans. And we're going to preach the gospel all around different gypsy camps. And we're going to end up in Uri. So praise God, a couple of months went by and they did come over. They did preach the gospel around Dublin, Limerick, Cork, all over. Thank God for them. And they did preach the gospel. And they come to Uri and I had no room in my yard because my yard was packed with stuff. And I had no room to let the caravans pull in. And my brother Joe and another brother of mine have a big yard with a big massive barn in the middle of it. And he left the caravans pull in there to his brothers in the Lord. And they cleaned out the barn, just what we're doing here tonight. And they put all the seats, the pulpit, and all this beautiful music. My, my eldest son went over the first night, thank God, and he was saved the first night. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He repented unto him, and he was washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus the first night, praise God. So thank God, my daughter Eileen, she went over the next night, and she come back in, and she said, Daddy, I'm a born-again Christian, I just busted out laughing at her. But deep down, I was happy for her. I was happy. So I, I better go over here and see what's going on over here. Because money was my God before I was saved. Money was my God. I thought it was a loophole. Here's a way, a new way of making a living. I see men going around with suits of clothes and their nails all filed. They wouldn't lift a pick or a shovel. They wouldn't lift no more than a pen. And I wanted to be like this. So here's a new way of making a living. Here's a new business. And I was all, all excited. I went over to that meeting with like a fine comb. I wanted to find a fault. I wanted to find a fault. And I didn't go special to it. I got all tidied up going to the club, in other words, going down to the hotel. And I'd done a detour around my brother's yard. And when I got to the brother's yard, I could not believe what cars I seen. And I heard all this beautiful music coming from this big barn where he kept horses in it. And all this beautiful music coming from it. And I thank God I went into the barn and I was at the back door. And you know when you're in a strange place in a gospel meeting for the first time in my life, I didn't know like in the going to a doctor or a waiting room or something. I didn't know where to put my hands. I thought everybody was watching me. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to scratch my head or hold my hand. I didn't know what to do. And I was ready to run, in other words. They're not going to get me. So praise God, I start looking at people in that meeting. I come over with a fine comb to find a fault. But I start looking at people and I seen tears coming down along their faces. And they're crying out to our Lord Jesus Christ to save the rest of their family souls. People that I knew in this pub time and they're not in the pub no more. And they're crying and meetings, praying. There's something wrong here. What's going on here? I start thinking, what's happening here? I listened to the word of God preached. The pastor was preaching the word of God. I listened to every bit of the word of God. And I certainly could not find no fault in it. I could find no money involved in it. But what I found for the first time in my life, I got a touch from God. It was Jesus Christ involved. It was the love of God was involved. Here is men and women that would go to the other ends of this earth for Jesus. 
because they know that he went all the way for them. He didn't go half the way. He didn't stop halfway to the cross. He went all the way and died and shed that precious blood for every person on this earth, not just one group of people. He died for everyone on this earth. Is any by the blood of Jesus Christ that our sins can be cleansed? No man can take away our sins. We have only one mediator between man and God. It's Jesus Christ. One and only mediator. And I praise God now that I know the truth. But anyway, at the end of the meeting, the pastor walked down to me. I was at the back of the door. And he said, Kevin, he said, do you know, he said, that God sent his one and only begotten son down in this earth to die for you? Say, what do you mean? I thought he was getting cheeky. Nobody ever said this to me in my life. Say, what do you mean? He said, God sent his one and only begotten son down in this earth, then died on the cross for you. And when you die, he said, and your soul goes to God to be judged, God is going to say to you, what did you do for my son, Jesus? And what, did you, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? And here was me. He said it about three times to me. You know the way some of us drives a car, we never ever thinks about the spare wheel in our car till we get a puncture. And then there's a spare wheel alert. Take it out to use it. Did we get it back off the neighbors? Did we get it mended the last time? Never thinks about the spare wheel. So many people never think about God till something goes wrong and then there's a God alert. Oh God help me. And when you get it fixed, put them away again. That's the way I used God all my life. All my life till seven years ago. But anyway, I, I couldn't answer him. I could not answer him. <clears throat> he said, I can lead you to the Lord right now. So I'm sorry, so it's not for me yet. But I thank God that the yet was there. I went over to a couple other meetings and praise God, I was blessed in every one. And they were telling me about this massive convention they're having in France. Tens of thousands of gypsy people saved, born-again Christians goes every year to this big, massive born-again Christian convention. You yes, have, to, have, to, have to hire a big airfield to hold the caravans. A city comes in overnight for a week. And it puts tents up over an acre and a half, some big tents. So one year we were there, there were seven different tents up. Massive. So they were telling me about this here. I never, ever took a holiday in my life before I was saved. My wife is from Liverpool, and the only holiday I ever took was taking my wife over to Liverpool, which is in Liverpool now at the minute. Taking her over to Liverpool, labor with her mother, and my holiday was up and down England drinking, partying, nightclubbing, and, and buy a few caravans and worried about getting them back to the boat. Worrying about it, they're going to be dinged. What chip am I going to put a man? Greed, give me more, give me more. Money, partying. But I thank God that this day, all day went away, they put away, and they went back to England. There's about 10,000 gypsy people saved in England at this minute. They have, I think, 17 churches at the minute, praise God. And I thank God there's about 100, maybe 200,000 now, maybe, saved throughout Europe, praise God. And I thank God Ireland here, north and south, is the hardest country in all of Europe to get through to the gypsy people. They're binded up in religion, God help them. And they need to be told the truth. They need to be told the truth. So praise God. The brothers all packed up and went away back to England. I drive a lorry during the day. I carry mobile homes and a big transporter. And you know, some days you maybe drive a couple of hundred miles, and when you're alone by yourself, you do a lot of thinking. And I'm driving along this particular day, and I'm thinking about those brothers, and this word kept coming back to me. What did you do for my son Jesus? And I start thinking in this story, am I going to turn into a piece of dust? Is my wife and children never going to see me again? Is my brothers and sisters never going to see me again? There's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to it. I start asking myself this in the lorry. The tears start coming down along my face. I didn't cry like this in my life before. I didn't know what was happening to me. I couldn't wait to get to a lay-by to pull in. I got a bit of a notebook out. This is the way I run a business. And this is the way, thank God, the Lord has shown me. This is the way I write there. And I praise God, I got a notebook out, and I start writing down all the things that God done for me. He gave me a good wife, he gave me good children, he gave me a good mother and father, good brothers and sisters, he gave me a good home, a good business, he gave me my health, the clothes on my back, the food on my table, he gave me the very air that I breathed. God has given to me. 
And I start filling all those pages down. And I left one page for him. What did I do for him? And I could not put nothing on it. And then I knew that I needed Jesus. I didn't realize that I could have cried out in the cabin at glory to ask Jesus Christ to forgive me for my sins and ask the Holy Spirit to come in and live in my heart and he would have done it. I didn't realize I was let to go to a man. For 40 odd years, I was tied like a horse, led by man. And I heard about those brothers going away to France. And I thought I had to go to this brother said to me, what do you do for my son Jesus? Because I didn't want to go to hell. I want to be saved. And I come back that evening to my wife and my children. And say, so we're, so we're going on a holiday. And they thought we're going to Liverpool again. So I, this time, say, so we're going to France. And I would love if I had a camera to take the smiles, that they want to see the smiles on their faces. Even the old dog I had was covered over mucking, he jumping up in me, that uh, jumping up in me, I had to bait him down even to stop me, he was that happy. But I couldn't bring him with the rabies. <laughs> we had a big massive caravan and a Land Rover, and we hitched the Land Rover, the caravan onto the Land Rover, and away we headed to France. Right across England we got off at, at Cali, and it was getting late when we got off, and I didn't realise about the other side of the road. The left hand side. And everything was going nicely till we come to a roundabout and I seen an awful lot of people making a mistake. <laughs> so I went around the normal way around the roundabout and I got a lot of cars beeping at me. And I come right onto the docks and I'm not going another inch till morning till we follow a lorry or get the hang of the road. So the next morning come and I was all excited with about 400 miles to drive inland in the Midlands of France it was, where the convention was. And I was all excited to get this French cheese and the grapes off the trees when you're driving along the road even. And I got up early the next morning and I told my wife, I please I try and get the children ready and we get away if I was 400 miles to drive. And my wife, some women get quick, ready quicker than others, but mine is the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, praise God. I went away looking at the hovercrafts coming in and I come back about a half an hour and I just say, just take your time. So I went away and got a cup of coffee and about an hour after I was thinking that if she's not ready now I'm going to pull the door off this caravan. The steam was actually coming out of my ears because I was thinking about all this journey and about the other side of the road and I worried to death about it. So thank God she was ready. So praise God she was doing the navigation with the road map and we come exactly to the same roundabout again and I wanted to get my own back on her. Overall the way she laid this time about two or three hours late. So anyway, I so said, what way? She said, this way. But deep down, I knew for 100% it was that way. So I, it's not that way. Yes, she said, it's this way. Well, say, so you said that's the road, say, so you have the map, say, so you satisfied this is the way. Yes. Well, say, so wherever this road goes, I were staying on it. And I was very stubborn before I was saved. And this is the truth, we end up in Belgium. We went from Belgium. We're blessing that country, praise God. We went from Belgium into Luxembourg and from Luxembourg into Germany and up along the borders of Fra Germany with France. And we come into a city called Nancy. And there was a lot of one-way systems around this city. I, I, I think I made a couple of mistakes in it. I didn't want to make another mistake to go down a cul-de-sac or something with this big caravan. It was nearly 30 foot long behind the car, the Land Rover. And I decided to ask, some, ask somebody what is the right way to the other route to Paris because all the roads lead to Paris. If you get out onto the, onto the auto bonds, then you can just no bother. So praise God, this woman coming down along say, excuse me, say, do you speak English? The woman didn't know what I said. <laughs> Another woman come with a child, say, excuse me, say, do you speak English? She did not know what I said. But I seen a man coming with a suit of clothes on him, and he must have waited all his life for somebody to say this one word to him. <laughs> say, excuse me, sir, say, do you speak English? And a big smile come on his face. He looked in the car, do I speak English? I speak German, Dutch, French, and he kept saying, a song of Say, Please, sir. So I only want to know what is the right way to the other route to Paris. So he said, sir, he said, and he started shaking his head. Would you believe, he said, I am completely, totally lost here myself. He said, this is the truth. But he said, you go down there, he said, and take a right and a lift, he said, and you should be okay. And he walked down. I was just going to put the motor in gear. So that's the most stupidest thing that I've ever heard in my life. There's a lost man trying to tell me the way. <laughs> I know people that are sitting in churches 70 and 80 and 90 years listening to a lost man trying to tell them the way. It certainly cannot be done. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the way. Not a religion, not a man.
Jesus is the way. That is the truth. Jesus is the way and he's the truth and the life. And you must come to him to get to the Father. He is the way. He's the door. You won't even see the kingdom of God unless you repent. Unless you be washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus. So many poor people is getting played wrong in all different great churches right through the country. It doesn't not, not Catholics or Protestants or Hindus and Muslims, all getting led. Not all. Sometime God as ministers say, praise God for it. I thank God. You see, when a brother is preaching from here, then he knows the way. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. This word is alive. This is God's word. If they're coming out with fancy stories, well then that's not, a, not the way. Jesus is the way. And I thank God that there's so many ministers right through this country to thank God being saved at this minute right through this land. I praise God for that. Because a lost man cannot tell nobody the way. He can tell you about your cats, about your dogs, and about your garden, about your children well-dressed, and rub you like a cat. That's not going to get you to heaven. You must repent and be washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus. Because he died for all. But I thank God when I got to that convention, I could not believe what I was seeing. I seen tens of thousands of caravans. I seen a whole sea of caravans. And all gypsy people, 99% of them was, were gypsies. No fighting, no drinking, no arguing. And I went and I looked around for the English registration cars for to find the brothers that was in my, in my brother's yard. And a whole group of them, there must be about 50 caravans of, of English ones. And I praise God, I put them there, a man that I never even knew, put their arms around me and hugged me. But I could feel a hug, a hug of wanting to give something, not to take from you. A real hug, a hug of love, God's love. And I went to that brother and said, what do I have to do? So I want to be saved. So I want to be a born again Christian. They counseled me and took me into a caravan. And from that day forward, my life completely changed. I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, which he is. And I thank God that my life, he took away drinking, he took away smoking dope, he took away lying and cheating for me. He changed my life completely. I can change, see my wife and children in a completely a different outlook. God has given me a portion of love from heaven and is real. It's not imitation love, it cannot be bought. It cannot be bought. I used to drive cars, stupid drunk, coming home at all hours in the morning, shutting one eye and see one white line on the road. If I opened my two eyes, I could see three or four lines on the road. That's how I used to drive home sometimes. I would all smell of other things off me, other women, and wait for my wife sitting up at all hours in the morning for me. That's the way I was. That was my life one time. I'm a party going to hell, and I didn't know. Thought that a religion could take me to heaven. And I thank God for the Lord, the way he've changed my life. I start looking at mountains and trees that I never bothered looking at before in my life. Even when I come home, I had shrubs and plants around my own home that I never even knew I had. That is the truth. And now I can see a different world out there. The Lord had given me love for every person on this earth. Not just one. Not one group of people. Jesus died for all. Right through the whole country. But I'm going to share an illustration with you. I shared it umpteen times before. And I'm going to make his laugh. Praise God. <laughs> Thank God. You see, as I said earlier on, I keep a lot of different types of animals. I have llamas, all different types of animals. But where I go to buy the food for my animal, I've shared this umpteen different times about this parrot. And this shop is a big, massive place. And the man have hamsters, he have goldfish, he have pet rabbits, he have, he have, he have all different types of animals, cats and pups and everything in this place. But in the middle of the floor, you have a big massive cage with a parrot in it. And every time I walked into this building, I went, never looked at nobody, just went straight to the parrot and sung, my shackles is gone, my spirit is free, oh, praise the Lord, he lifted me. For six months, I've done this. And this man must be getting sick to death of watching me coming in every week, singing the same song. He said, Mr. Parsley, he said, could I have a word with you? Say, what is it? He said, I've noticed you, he said, for the last six months, every week you come, he said, you go straight to the parrot and you sing, my shackles is gone, my spirit is free, oh, praise the Lord, he lifted me. He learned the song, thank God. <laughs> so praise God. He said, I want to explain something to you. He said, we have that parrot 10 years. 
and he hasn't spoken one word yet. So it's any waste of time what you're doing. So the following week come, I come straight into the through the building, straight to the parrot. My shackles is gone, my spirit is free. Oh, praise the Lord, he lifted me. I could see the man out of the corner of my eye shaking his head. We say, this man is gone. <laughs> but a few days after, in the living room of my house, you can see the entrance, daddy cars coming in. And this car come in doing about 40 or 50 miles an hour in my entrance, and it was the color that wore this man driving it. I never seen a more excitement look a man in my life. I thought he killed somebody. And he run to the door, Mr. Purcell, Mr. Purcell. Say, what is it? What is it? He said, quick, he said, quick. He said, the power to sing in my shackles is gone. My spirit is free. Oh, praise the Lord. He lifted me. And I got all excited. And I run into his, got into his car and where I should have brought me on, I way on down and into the place, and here was about 10 people around the parrot, and the parrot singing, my shackles is gone, and here's all the people singing with the parrot. But I knew most of the people. I knew most of the people. I knew one person was waiting on a result coming back. I knew another one had a financially problem. I knew more had marriage problems. I could see all people singing, my shackles is gone, my spirit is free, oh praise the Lord, he lifted me, plastic smiles and faces. Did anybody ever say to you, how are you doing? Oh, doing great. And then when it come dark and lying on that pillow, even some nights you maybe have to turn the pillow over and get that wet crying. And they're not free at all. Not free. If somebody walked into that door with a gun, the first thing we all have to do is put our hands up, surrender with both hands. But God wants you to do that, surrender with both hands. Not with one hand, hold an hand to it. I know that my Father, God, can move mountains. No matter how big of a problem is in front of you at this minute, I let it be a marriage problem, let it be a financial problem, let it be a health problem, I don't care how big it is, I know for 100% that Jesus Christ can move it. Hallelujah. I know that. Hallelujah. And there's no use of praying Praying a doubtful prayer. Because if you're praying a doubtful prayer, your prayer is certainly not going to be answered. Because as a matter of fact, Satan will give you all fancy words even to pray. Because he knows it's not going to be answered. But if you're praying with faith, knowing and believing that he's going to move that mountain, he will move it. Because I've seen mountains and mountains of problems that Satan has put in front of me. And I thank God there's only God he says could move them. No man could move them. And many of the time I tried getting over a mountain and get up the height of that wall and sit and pull me right back down. I didn't know what to do with it. Because I wasn't a child of God before I was saved. When I used to pray like having a ball in my hand firing against that wall and bouncing back, getting nowhere. Me and Thomas was in America in Phoenix, Phoenix Arizona. And there was 12,000 people in one building. And if Thomas cried out with, amongst them 12,000 people, I could recognize his voice because he's my son. But you see, before I was saved, I wasn't a child of God. But you know now that I have read, repented my sins unto Jesus and washed and cleansed in his blood, now I am a child of God. And now my Father hears my prayers. He answers every one of those prayers. Every prayer that I pray, God will answer. Because God is not a liar. He says every prayer. If you're praying with faith, it's a mustard seed. It's a small little seed. If you're praying with that much faith, he'll move that mountain clear to the way. Because I know it's him and him only can do it. That is the truth. Can I show one more little illustration? This one here now, I'm going to share it as well. Maybe, yes, I will share it in the name of God. It's about the camel. You see, the time before I was saved, I used to joke an awful lot about hell. Passes is a joke. Even tell fortunes. I make a joke about hell about nightlife in it down there, women, drugs, party and drink down there. But you see, I, I only knew of it. I didn't know nothing about it. But I, all my life, I always wanted a camel. I don't know why. Maybe I seen that film of Lawrence Arabia when I was a child and got carried away with all the camels in the desert. And I always wanted a camel. But one day I was coming back from Dublin in the lorry, coming through Dundalk, and I seen the biggest circus that I've ever witnessed in my life. And it was from Italy. 
And I've seen the hundreds of, of animals all around the circus. They had a herd of elephants, they had rhinos and hippos, and they had a whole load of camels. And I couldn't get the lorry parked. It was during the day in all cars along the road looking at the animals tied in the field. And I was all excited about all those camels I'd seen. I said, maybe they sell one. So when I come home, I told Thomas I might have seen the biggest circus in the world. So I will go and will ask him tomorrow, would he sell a camel? So the next, that night I couldn't even sleep, thinking about, I hope he sell a camel, and all excited. See, God will answer any prayer. So praise God, the next day come, and me and Thomas went out in the car, in a brand new car at the time, two days old it was. And I went out, not talking about the car, but what happened. So I went out to, to the next morning, out to the circus, and drove in around, it wasn't open, and in around, and everyone I talked to, nobody could speak English, all spaghetti, you know, in Italian. In other words, they kept pointing at this big wagon. So I, and I thought then the, the boss must be in there. So I went to knock the door and out comes this young Italian man. He said, can I help you? So I, so, so I keep a lot of different animals myself, so I always wanted a camel. So I, I wonder, have you got here a camel for sale? And he looked down at me shoes and he looked up along me. Are you real, in other words? Are you serious? He never spoke for about two minutes. I was even getting embarrassed looking at him. What was he going to say? So anyway, he said, you want to buy a camel? I said, yes. He said, okay. He said, we have one camel for sale. Come this way. And all around those circus wagons, in around, and the, here was this corral and this camels in it. And the very camel that I would pick, he said, this one we would sell. I have tried zoos, wouldn't sell them. I was going to import one and it cost a fortune for quarantine. And here's a man said, this one we will sell. And all bells start ringing, yes, in my own mind. Whatever he asked for it, I'm taking his mind. So he asked me a price and we had a bit of haggle. And we agreed and okay. But they're getting a million pound into my hand when he said, it's mine. So I got all excited. So the next, so I'll have to come back tomorrow. So I have to go to the bank and get a box to carry the camel. He said, oh, okay, he says, no problem. Only one man could speak English in the whole place. So praise God, that night I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about riding this camel out around and dressing up as an Arab down around the town and everything. All excited, nobody would be getting carried away like a child. So praise God. The next day come, we went to the bank and got this box of it. It's this brand new horse box that carries three horses off a neighbor of mine and the most particular man on this sort of thing with his tools, with his equipment. And he gave it to me because I knew him well. I didn't tell him what I was getting in, putting in this box. He thought maybe it was a llama or a donkey or something. So I put it onto the car and it was nearly too big for my car. And we got to Dundalk and drove in around the circus and I went to the man and knocked the door and he came out and he came out with a smile and I started paying him for this camel. And he said in his Italian words to those other men, go, in other words, go and get the camel. Go and get it. I could understand that part of it. So I need to pay them anyway. So we're just walking around. And you look, I don't know what you got a lap, rap of a lamppost or a rap of a sledge in the Ford. But I walked around this caravan, this big wagon, and I never got a bigger shock in my life. Here I've seen about seven colored men with a rope that you could tie up the Queen Mary ship with, and they're pulling this camel, and they're snapping, and they're spitting at him, and they're going mad to kill the men. And it's mine, I'm at a pain for it, I bought it, and it's mine, I'm going to take it home to my wife and children. A monster, about eight foot high. I thought it was like a pony. I thought you could lead it around. I thought it was no problem. I only knew of it all my life. But I didn't know about it. All my life I knew of it. So no way I wanted to help those men to get loading this camel. I was trying to change my mind out of it. I wouldn't even let them keep the money even. All I wanted is a way from this place. I was white as that Bible. The color of I, I was ready to faith I was. Well, this camel was going berserk he was. They got grain and apples and everything in the world trying to coax them into the box and about eight of them into the one door and pulling this camel into the box. But eventually they got him in and when they got him into the box, the front of the box went down on the ground and the, and the front of my car went up like a wheelbarrow. <laughs> Nothing was going right. I looked at Thomas, I son side, what am I actually doing? I looked at me, he said, Daddy, I don't know. So we may take it home and shoot it. <laughs> this is the truth. I was stuck with it, I had to take it. So we got out onto the road and doing about 20 miles an hour down along the road and I worried about getting pulled up with the police overloaded with this big monster, monster in this brand new box onto the man in a brand new car and here's a big monster I'm taking home with my wife and my wife don't know about it. I was even joking, she thought I was joking. 
And I went into the house, and I had to get a, a jack to take it off of the car and put it onto the Land Rover. And now all I want to see this camel in the stable, shut the door and wake up in the morning, it won't be there. But we took it around into the stable, and we spent about a half an hour getting it out of the box. And we got gates, we didn't want to go near it, we had to push it with gates. And got it over where I thought it was going to go in and shut the door and that's it at the end of it. In the morning it won't be, no, it won't be there no more. And I got it to the stable and the stable door was too small. The camel was way up about two foot higher than the stable. And I had to get a stage, a brand new stable, break the whole top off. And when I got him inside, this is the truth, I got him into the stable and he started lifting his thumbs and he lifted the roof off the stable. <laughs> Nothing was going right. You see, only knew of it, I knew nothing about it, I never read about it. But I know now that hell is mentioned more in the word of God than heaven. I don't want anybody to ever get the shock that I got with a camel and there's nothing like the shock you get when you go to the gates of hell. There is no out of hell. It's not like going to prison for a 10 year or a year or whatever it may be. You get a date to come out. When you go through the gates of hell, there is no out whatsoever. You're there burning, screaming, grinding up teeth. No partying, no drugs, no drink, no messing about down there. Burning and screaming forever and ever in hell. It's real. It's heaven, God, hell and the devil. No in between. No in between, it doesn't say here anything in between, poetry or anything like that. There's no in between. Heaven or hell. And there is a coming a day that each one of our lives is going to be taken from our bodies. And it's not a game. It's not a game. God is alive. Satan is out to rob you of your soul. He can have peace and happiness in heaven where the streets is paved with gold. No more aches or pains. No more disabled. Everything perfect. The streets is even paved. A mansion waiting for each one of us there. That's what's waiting for us there. But you know if you reject Christ, you know what's waiting for you? It's burning and screaming. Rowing in hell forever and ever and ever. No out. It's real. It's not a game. It's not a joke no more. I used to joke about it. I didn't know the danger my soul was in when I was laughing and joking. I thought that a religion could bring me one time. But now I know that no one's religion can get him to heaven. Only Jesus. And I know that God loves us. I know that each one of us, on this earth, there's neither one of us without sin. We're all born with sin. It all started in the Garden of Eden. Go out and multiply. And each one of us is descendants from Adam and Eve. Each one of us is sent us from Adam and Eve. No sin in heaven, no stain in heaven. How are you going to get into heaven with sin in your soul? It's only by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that can cleanse your sin. No detergent. You can buy all the best washing powder that you can get, money can buy, but it certainly cannot move that stain from your soul. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ can move that. And it only takes one little prayer. One little prayer. And God will change your life. You can't change it, but God will change it. Because you have changed mine. No man could have done me. No man could have changed my life. My wife trying to change my life. My mother and father trying to stop me from the things I was doing. They couldn't do it. But Jesus done it. God done it. Because I want him to do it. I want him to do it. Because he gave me love on this earth for every person. And hell is real. It's not a game. It's not a joke. It is real. And neither one of us is going to live on this earth forever. It's coming a day that each one of us is going to be taken from this earth. Some of, most of us, every one of us, have somebody gone before us. So our bus is coming in. Isn't it nice to know what bus we're getting on? Wouldn't it be terrible if you're gone on the wrong bus? And led by a man for the lead you onto the long, wrong bus and give you the wrong ticket going down, not the one going up. But you know, when you come to Christ, your name is on the Lamb's Book of Life in Heaven, that you are arrested, you are booked in there. And when your time come, when you're taken from this earth, then you're going into heaven. And you will know that you know, that you know, that you're saved, that you're born again. Hi.